are looking at this issue, making forgiveness permanent. You should know that in Christ, you are eternally forgiven. We are going to look at how can God really forgive us forever? One of the most frequently asked questions is this, how can I know that, God, that I have an eternal relationship with God? How can I know that I have an eternal relationship with God? In other words, how can I be sure that I am going to heaven when I die? Is my salvation secure? Chapter 5 in 1 John deals with this issue. The entire chapter deals with how do you know that you are a child of God? I just want to lift one of those verses. It is is at the top of your outlines, verse 13. It says this. I write these things to you who, who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Would you circle the word no and then circle the words eternal life and draw a line between them? Because this verse says that God wants you to know that you have eternal life. The word know refers to to knowing within your heart, to know for certain, to know something that you are never, ever going to forget, to know something of extreme importance. The words eternal life means more than just quantity of life. It also means quality of life. It's a life that matters, a life of significance, a life of peace, a life of joy, a life that God wants to give you. When we think about eternal life, we think about heaven and we think about eternity, but eternal life really begins right now in the everyday world of our lives when we turn our hearts to Christ. That's when eternal life begins. Here's how to make God's forgiveness permanent in your life. Here's how to experience God's forgiveness forever. Number one, believe in God's amazing grace. Believe in God's amazing grace. How can I know that I have an eternal relationship with God? How can I be sure that I am going to heaven when I die? Is my salvation secure? I have to believe in God's amazing grace. I have to recognize what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. How his death and resurrection has changed my relationship with God forever. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot earn eternal forgiveness. There is nothing you and I can do humanly to gain our entrance into heaven or gain eternal forgiveness. We have to receive that in Jesus Christ. That's what Easter is all about. We celebrated Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. The church word we use to describe this is grace. You see, because of our sin, because you and I have sinned, we have gone our own way like the prodigal who has left the heavenly father. We can't forgive ourselves. We can't earn our way back. But God loves us too much to leave us astray. So God does what only God can do. God sends his son, Jesus Christ, to bring us back home. When we place our lives in Christ, we, are, we have a home in heaven for all eternity. When we place our lives in Christ, we have a home in heaven for all eternity. We enter into the kingdom of God that begins right now, right here, and extends into eternity forever and ever. Ephesians 1 describes what it means to believe in God's amazing grace. It says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. 
I love these verses. These verses tell us that God says, in Christ, you are blessed. In Christ, you were adopted. In Christ, you were set free. And in Christ, you are eternally forgiven. This is so important. To believe means to accept, to acknowledge, to attest. This idea of placing your life in Christ is so critical. In fact, that's what it means to become a Christian. Becoming a Christian simply means that you made a spiritual decision to take your life and you place it in Christ. When you believe in God's amazing grace, you can have the assurance that God's forgiveness is forever available to you. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't buy it. You don't work hard enough to get it. You just make the spiritual decision. Perhaps you are someone who is not sure that you have made that decision. Well, today can be the day. Right there in your communication slip where it says decisions, it simply says, I am committing my life to Jesus Christ for the first time. If that's you today, I just encourage you to put a check mark, put an X at that place. I am committing my life to Jesus Christ for the first time. That's the spiritual decision I'm talking about. Believe in God's amazing grace. That's the first step in making God's forgiveness permanent. Once you have received God's amazing grace, number two is confess my sins to God. One way to know whether or not you are going to be in heaven is whether or not you admit your sins on a regular basis. On whether or not you admit your sins regularly. Confession is a conversation between you and God. Just because you believe in Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, once you place your life in Christ, doesn't mean you're perfect. As Christians, we continue to sin. We continue to mess up. Sin damages the everyday fellowship. It doesn't damage the eternal relationship. Sin does damage to the fellowship we can enjoy with God. We can be in Christ and still feel distant from God. When we confess our sin, we restore the everyday fellowship. When we confess, we are agreeing that our sin is bad and is destructive toward God's purpose in our lives. 1 John 1 verse 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Confession means that we are taking responsibility for our actions. We aren't blaming anybody else. We aren't trying to pass the buck. We are saying, God, we did it. We are taking responsibility. We are showing to God that we are interested in growing in our faith. To be connected to Christ means we seek to grow as a person. When we confess our sins to God, we are saying that we are depending upon God to restore our relationship. God draws himself back to us. Notice James 4, verses 6 to 10. It says this, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You see, this topic of confession isn't really popular, even among Christians. We don't want to talk about confession. We've got a sign out here on the highway, you know. Imagine if we put on there, grieve, mourn, and wail. Welcome to Bristol United Methodist Church, right? But for the Christian, confession is vital. It's vital to a healthy spiritual life. Confession extremely, is extremely important if we're going to make forgiveness permanent. 
Do you feel distant from God today? Do you feel like God is a, is a little far away? Maybe you need to confess and humble yourself before God and begin to experience these verses in James and allow God to draw near to you as you draw near to God. This is one of the enjoyments you and I can have once we believe in God's amazing grace, once we commit our lives to Jesus Christ. It's called having an ongoing relationship with God. Part of having a relationship with God, what God is trying to teach us is, number three, enjoy the benefits of being a child of God. The issue really comes down to this simple question. Now, if you say yes to this question, if you honestly say yes to this question, then you can be assured that eternal life awaits you. And that's this. Do you desire to obey God? Even if I mess up, if I have a desire to obey God, then God restores our fellowship when I confess my sin to God. On the back of your outlines at the top, 1 John 3 verse 1 says this, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. As Christians, this is a great freedom. The idea that God would call us his children. That God says, when you are in Christ, you are his son, you are his daughter. But some of us miss out on, on, on all this, what all this means because we have a false understanding of what it means to be a father. Many of us are unable to understand this love of our Heavenly Father because we have seen or experienced such poor examples of love from our earthly father. Listen, Christian psychologists have taught a very insightful truth. They tell us that we tend to relate to our Heavenly Father in the same ways that we relate to our earthly father. Now, if you had a great earthly father who did all the things that loving fathers should do, then this is not an issue for you. But if you're like many of us, and you had an earthly father who, who was really a mere human, who, who sometimes sinned against us, who sometimes hurt us, then this can be a problem. There is no doubt that this is a pretty emotional issue for a lot of us. But it is one that we need to clear up so that we can fully enjoy our rightful place as God's child. I can clear this up by comparing life to being part of a football team. Remember, when I first met you, I told you everything relates to football, okay? When I played high school football, we had a couple of coaches who were complete opposites of each other. We had a head, co we had a head coach who you might call the good coach. He very rarely went off on you. In fact, his son was a quarterback. He was always encouraging us. He worked, us, and he, he worked to develop us and was extremely patient with us. It was like you didn't want to make a mistake, not because you'd get in trouble, not because he'd yell at you, but because you didn't want to disappoint him. He was a good coach. But then we had an assistant coach who was the exact opposite. He would constantly remind you of your shortcomings. He would literally get in your face, and as he was yelling at you, he would spit at you, demanding more and more effort. I had personal experience with that coach. <laughs> when you made a mistake, he would literally tell you what a loser you were. Come on, Lewis, what are you doing? Now, let's pretend for just a moment that you are the child of the bad coach. When you hear me talk about God as your heavenly father and you hear me talking about wanting to obey him, you are like, who are you kidding? I don't want to hear about a God like that. A God who constantly reminds you of your shortcomings a heavenly father who constantly makes you feel guilty for being his child, a father in 
who sits up in heaven with a clipboard writing down all the things you have done wrong? The reality is, if we don't work at it, some of us allow our image of our heavenly fathers to be projected on our heavenly father. If, we don't, if we're not careful, our image of our earthly fathers are oftentimes projected on our heavenly father. But now imagine for just a moment that you are the child of the good coach, a coach who encourages you, a coach who is constantly pulling for you, a coach who who works patiently with you and desires to see you live up to your full potential. With that in mind, let's look at these verses in Colossians 3. The first one says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. When you read that verse with the good coach in mind, that verse can be motivating. Read on. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. When we read that that verse with the perspective of the good coach, then that verse is not condemning, it is motivating. God has a better plan for your life. Tap into God, trust him, and God can clean you from all the mud and gunk that can slow you down and deny the redeeming relationship God wants to have with you. Verse 8 says this, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Friends, your heavenly father is a good coach. Those of us who have had a poor example of a loving father, we need to embrace the truth of God's word. God is a loving father, and when we experience God's discipline through our heartfelt confession, God redeems us. The Bible says the Lord disciplines the one he loves. When it comes to hardship, and we will face hardship in this life, we can endure it because we are the coach's son or daughter. Our God loves us and wants what is best for us. Three final thoughts. When you sin, you don't lose your place in God's family. You can enjoy the benefits of being a child of God. Remember this question. Do you desire to obey God? If you do, you can confess your sins to God and be restored. Listen, some of you are walking around and every time you do something wrong, you're thinking, Did I lose my place? Am I out? Has God canceled my reservation in heaven? You don't have to worry about that. God is not going to kick you off the team. Your place is secured because of Jesus Christ. Second, when you are God's child, you can break the cycle of sin. How? Through the power of choice. You can say no to sin. You can break that cycle. Notice Romans 6, 14 in your outlines. Would you read this verse out loud to me? You see it there? It's the second to last one in the back of your outlines there. Romans 6, 14. Let's read this one out loud together. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Finally, God is a God of second chances. God is not just a God of second chances. He is a God of third chances, fourth chances, 15th chances. Romans 37, Romans 8, 37, 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, 
neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Enjoy the benefits of being a child of God. Maybe today you need to recommit your life to Christ. You realize today you are living life far too away from God's presence. Won't you come home today? Like the prodigal son we talked about at Easter, you know, God has the fatted calf ready for you. God is the good coach who wants to have a party, who is patient with you, and you know what? If you stray again, God will do that over and over and over, always wooing you, ready to embrace you when you come home from the sin that entangles you. Pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, I thank you that in Christ I have an eternal home in heaven waiting for me. Thank you for forgiving me completely, freely, and eternally. Help me to confess my sins daily so that I can maintain a clear relationship with you. I want to live obediently as your child. So God, today, I am recommitting my life to you. We pray all of this together in Jesus' name.